Hi everyone. This week uh, we have been talking about global water diplomacy. Earlier we discussed about the various disputes in the sector of water. Now we are going to focus on the cooperation of water. So, we will uh, see how cooperation and diplomacy uh, or diplomatic level participation in the terms of management of transboundary uh, water resources helps in uh, bridging the gaps, bringing the nation together. So, that is what we will be discussing. To start with, we already uh, in the previous week, we did see various disputes, uh, we discussed some of the disputes as well, as well as coordination and cooperation also, framing treaties and how uh, it is going to uh, resolve the cases. So, essentially the cooperation is needed for resolution of water conflicts okay. and uh, there are variety of water conflicts for variety of reasons at times, okay. we have already discussed that. So, these are like some of the uh, main or uh, main water conflicts that our uh, world often talks about in the Colombia between Canada and US, the Colorado River, uh, Mexico and US, this has been a big conflict between the two nations. Okay. So, that way uh, there are some specific case studies we already discussed about the Nile, Mekong River and uh, that way there are uh, all these conflicts and this thing arises. These conflicts typically mostly actually are onto the sharing of water or allocation of water for the purpose of irrigation, hydroelectric or uh, industrial or domestic consumption purpose. However, at times the uh, such issues or conflicts can raise over the uh, quality issues as well. Like for example, uh, in the European countries there was there were a conflict over a river water for the quality. So, they basically come together under an umbrella and signed a treaty to manage the quality of the water in uh, a river basin. So, the in order to overcome such conflicts or in order to overcome the points of such conflicts, it is needed that uh, the relationship between water and its disaster risk are collectively addressed. Okay. So, uh, that is uh, that was point was emphasized in the UN Secretary General's Water and Sanitation Advisory Board in 2015. According to this UN water, the water institutions are uh, still largely technology and water supply driven, but that is not going to, to the serve purpose as we have discussed earlier that water is a truly interdisciplinary management subject and their needs, the, it needs actually the people from the different backgrounds, different expertise to come participate, take part in uh, have a discussion and then come up with an integrating water uh, management plan. So, that was also emphasized and it was says that it should gradually change from technological solutions to the management of processes and people and then that is why involving inclusive decision making. This should not be considered as undermining the importance of technological solution. The technolo technological solution has their own importance, they have be been important in the past and they will still be important in the future, but it is not that only technology can solve these issues. There has to be basically uh, due attention given to the management of people, processes, policy making, sustainability aspects involving stakeholders, so all those things had should be given. Now, water diplomacy is about preventing and resolving these water related conflicts with both technical and governance interventions. So, it is not that just governance intervention can solve the problem or it is not that just technical intervention can solve the problem. We need both these together, the technical intervention as well as governance intervention to basically solve water related conflicts and that is what essentially comes under the water diplomacy. So, uh, if we look at the definition of water diplomacy, it includes all measures by state as well as non-state actors, non-state organization institutions 
that can be undertaken to prevent or peacefully resolve the emerging conflicts and that's way, that way facilitate cooperation related to water availability, allocation or its uses between and within the states and public and private stakeholders. So, that is how water diplomacy can be defined. Now, the diplomacy facilitates cooperation over water that is the prime motive of uh, talking about this water diplomacy. So, uh, water diplomacy will sort of try to facilitate that uh, a cooperation can be developed over water and conflicts can be resolved in that manner. Now, since water issues either local as well as transboundary water issues are very complex to manage, the bridging different values uh, and goals, different objectives, different interests of various nations or society requires a well informed mutual gain diplomacy process. Okay. That is very important that uh, it is not that just two people can sit and discuss and sort out the issues, it is not as a simple process. It, uh, it basically needs or requires several inputs, it requires inputs on the uh, what are the basic issues, who is losing what, who is gaining what, what are the available resources, what are the requirement from different parties. So, uh, all this information would be should be available for uh, taking this discussion, taking this deliberation or talk further in a diplomatic manner. So, based on this mutual gain approach, uh, this water diplomacy may play an increasingly important role in preventing, mitigating and resolving the conflicts over water which are actually growing day by day. The importance includes interest of multiple dimensions and multiple stakeholders. So, that is uh, very uh, very much prime import uh, uh, that is sort of uh, must in order to go for cooperation process. Because if you do not take care of mutual interest, if you do not take care of the interest of all the multiple stakeholders, it the diplomacy is not going to work. Because uh, this cooperation cannot be as we were discussing in the earlier uh, session as well, cooperation cannot be one sided. It has to be basically one has to consider the needs and requirements of the other parties as well and then only a cooperation can be built up. So, prevention and resolution of conflict will largely be the outcome of uh, processes of various uh, evaluations, statistical analysis, research, fact finding, negotiations. Uh, then conciliations, uh, different type of mediating agency may be required. The idea is to basically root an in-depth understanding of social, cultural, economic and environmental conditions of the involved part, uh, parties and the political context of the issues as well. And this should be sort of eventually supported with sound assessment and integrated analysis of the available resources and water systems. So, if you look at the benefits of uh, water cooperation, well there are uh, four different type of benefits are highlighted. The water cooperation can have benefit uh, in to the river. So, by cooperation actually the river itself can get benefited in terms of uh, improved water quality, river flow characteristics, soil conservation, biodiversity conservation and overall sustainability. It can have benefit from the river. So, people can derive benefit from the river or larger section or larger society can derive benefits from the river over improved water resources management for hydropower, agricultural protection purpose, flood drought management, navigation, environmental conservation over all these points uh, one can basically derive benefit from the river. Then uh, there could be reducing cost because of the river, so sort of financial benefits. So, because the policy safe development cooperation if it is managed properly in a more cooperated way, we can basically uh, get that in terms of uh, self sufficiency and there will be reduced dispute, conflict, risk and uh, those kind of thing.
will sort of uh, military expenditure and all those will uh, reduce. So, that will be the basic reduction in the cost to country, to nations, of course, not cost to the river. And then there are benefits beyond the river. So, uh, with such type of cooperation, the regional fragmentation goes away, there will be integration of regional infrastructure, markets, trade, so uh, society as well as culture also. So, in previous lecture, we were discussing that ultimate stage of cooperation, which was, uh, which was basically given a rating of 7, is the two nations merging and becoming one with uh, agreement and not under any pressure. It is not that somebody captures the territory of other, but with a, a collective cooperation, they decide to merge as one. So, that was the ultimate benefit cited. So, if we see the dispute and integration frames and look at the cooperation continuum. So, we have a uh, variety of uh, aspects, there, there could be a unilateral action, then there could be a coordination uh, component, collaboration component and then joint action component. As we move towards the left in this direction, it actually lead to dispute and as, as we move towards the right direction, it eventually leads to the cooperation and integration. Okay. So, that is how uh, and the different type of benefits, the type 1, type 2, type 3 and type 4 benefits we discussed eventually can be derived as we move forward towards the cooperative direction. So, that is what basically how the cooperation can support uh, these things. Then if we look at the history of water cooperation, the history of water cooperation is not new the if if we go uh, by the united nations document it says that the uh, the database or the history of international water treaties date as back as 2500 bc okay. so that's was that was the time when uh, first water treaty or the first known treaty was signed between two sumerian cities and this is actually often said to be the first treaty of any kind for that matter. Now, since then a large body of water treaties has emerged. The uh, estimate from the food and agricultural organizations of United Nations suggests that there are more than 3600 treaties, treaties related to the international water resources that has been developed since 2005 AD. So, much uh, before time. The most of that earlier treaties because there was no uh, as such scarcity of water resources, okay, the population was very low, resources was enough. So, the requirement of the cooperation was not in terms of fulfilling water demand, okay, requirement, requirement were more in terms of navigation and boundary demarcation. So, the treaties uh, earlier or the uh, historical treaties, most of the historical treaties was uh, signed to deal with the issues related to the navigation and boundary demarcation. But eventually as the progress takes place, the population growth takes place, the resource limitation came into the picture and our focus has shifted from navigation or boundary demarcation to more so over onto the consumptive or non-consumptive use of water okay, for a variety purpose. So, that way the focus of uh, negotiations and treaty making in particularly the last century has shifted away from uh, navigation and boundary demarcation most to uh, towards the use, the development, protection and conservation of water resources. So, the new treaties or new agreements between uh, different nations focus more on to these aspects rather than the navigation and this thing. So, uh, the 145 agreements which has been uh, signed uh, in recent past has actually distribution like this. So, out of that almost 40 percent considers hydropower, 40 percent is for utilization of water, then around uh, 9 percent for uh, flood control, then uh, 9 percent for industrial allocation and very few for navigation or those kind of thing. Okay. So, that is the status of uh, this uh, recent uh, focus for the treaties or for the cooperation, uh, international cooperation which is being developed. 
So, uh, despite the complexity of the problem which we discussed earlier uh, session, there are record shows that the water disputes can be handled diplomatically. Okay. In last 5 years, if we go by the United Nations information, in the last 50 years, there has been only 37 cases of acute disputes where violence was uh, involved. And there has been 150 treaties that have been signed. So, if we see the cases of dispute versus cases of cooperation, collective cooperation. So, cases of collective cooperation is much more prevailing over to the cases of dispute. Okay. So, nations value these agreements because they make international relations over water more stable and predictable and that is how uh, word is actually if we see. So, more, more than the dispute although these disputes are often more talked about because they create issues, they create media news, they come on the TV channels. So, they are more talked about and people are more aware about the popular disputes rather than the uh, cooperation which is uh, which does not make much of the news okay because things run smoothly in a uh, in a basically uh, things run in a very smooth fashion in a joint cooperated agreement so the water cooperation has survived along with the political conflicts also okay so the legal agreements on water sharing that has been negotiated, they maintained and uh, they have uh, survived even the conflicts between the parties or between the nations over other things. There has been several such examples on this. Okay. The uh, Mekong River Commission between Cambodia, Laos, Thailand and Vietnam has basically survived even though they are uh, in the technical exchanges throughout the Vietnam war. Okay. Israel and Jordan which uh, have been basically in a legal state of war are actually under uh, treaty under agreement over sharing the Jordan river which is still working. We have our own example in the form of Indus river commission which has still working even though India and Pakistan have been involved in two to three wars since then. Okay. We had two announced war and then one Kargil uh, dispute if you consider that also as a war. So, there, there are actually three wars between India and Pakistan since that time, but is still that uh, is surviving. So, that is how the uh, like nations value these treaties and uh, the water is such a thing that uh, the cooperation for water can still exist even if the nations are under dispute over other issues. So, uh, there are still quite a few persisting issues even after uh, so much of cooperation. Okay. There have been more than uh, 3600 agreement and treaties signed which is an achievement in itself, uh, but if one looks closely to them there are uh, some relevant significant weaknesses as well. The treaties have signed, but uh, it just signing or the signing an agreement does not may not actually be the sufficient, we need in addition that working monitoring provisions, we need the enforcement mechanisms that how the agreements or laws which are being made has should be enforced on the two countries and specific water allocation provisions. There are a sort of uh, all experts agree to this that international water course agreements need to be more concrete and setting out measures to enforce treaties. So, these treaties are signed, but if any dispute occur or if somebody is not fulfilling the treaties, there has to be a way to penalize or to internationally enforce the uh, obligations over the accepting nations. Okay. So, that is of very high importance and the better cooperation also entails the identifying clear and flexible clear, but still flexible water allocation. Flexibility is must because if you uh, we know that particularly the water uh, input in the form of precipitation and all that does not uh, remain constant over the years, it may vary. Sometime we may have high flood season, sometime we may have uh, low flood season or dry season. We were discussing the Kaveri uh, dispute in the previous week. 
So, uh, the most problem or the most violent situations arised when Karnataka was forced to fulfill the uh, demands in the period of drought. So, when uh, you are under an agreement and you yourself are not able to get the water, how you can leave water for others. So, still this allocation should be flexible okay. and uh, there has to be water quality standards also which uh, again uh, quality is a very important perspective. We talk so much about the water sharing and quantity prospects that we often uh, ignore or overlook the quality, but getting water is not sufficient, getting good quality water is of equally importance. There has been a quite a few international water laws and agreements on this, okay. uh, though no concrete or no uni universally accepted law on water is there. Okay. So, there has been basically couple of conventions as back as 1972-73 in London which uh, mostly uh, onto the sea water, then there was uh, another US convention law of sea in 1982. The important, uh, some of the important uh, international norms, international law in this was recognized in the form of the UN convention law of non-navigational uses. So, this was not for the sea non-navigational uses of international water course. This was presented in United Nations in 1997, but it has not ratified okay, because it needs certain members for uh, ratification and that much sign has not been done yet. There was a transboundary groundwater treaty also proposed, but that was also not signed. Uh, in Europe, uh, the United Nations members in the European countries they come up with a convention and protection of transboundary water course for international lakes in Europe and that is one of the uh, sort of landmark uh, agreement, but it is only limited to the European continental, European continent only. Uh, there are few other regional and uh, water body specific agreements were signed from time to time, but there is no as such a concrete international water law okay. and many experts actually are of opinion that the countries should sit together and come up with such a law so that it can be basically internationally implemented, but uh, again because the various countries have their own various interest and that is why it at times it cannot uh, be sort of formulated such a law which is acceptable to all. Well, again in treaties or agreement based on all these things, there has been uh, several water law cases filed in, in the International Court of Justice. Okay. So, uh, some of them are listed here, uh, the uh, Chile and Bolivia went under the uh, dispute over the status of water use in uh, Salala river in June to, uh, 2016. That way there are many other, okay, the Argentina and Uruguay uh, conflict, then uh, Bostavana and Namibia, Hungary and Slovakia. So, uh, quite a few uh, Costa Rica and this, so they have been basically uh, moving to the international courts from time to time over settlement of the water issues. However, again if you see that the uh, more prominent or larger or uh, bigger countries do not uh, bother such too much about the international court of justice and all that. Then there are international water institutions, uh, there are uh, quite a few fresh water institutions have been established on an international scale and so there are quite a, so these are the uh, some list of the fresh water institutions, these are some marine institutions which take care of the international uh, measures. Okay. So, they of course, have a different focus, these, instit uh, these in institutions may have different focus looking at uh, the different aspects of the water sharing or international uh, issues. The United Nations initiatives in this regard has come in form of the General Assembly resolution on the law of transboundary aquifers. Okay. So, this was passed, uh, this was adopted in December uh, 2021. Okay, in the uh, 63rd session of the UN General Assembly. The resolution encourages uh, the different states to make appropriate bilateral and uh, regional arrangements 
for the management of their transboundary aquifers. The aim should be to prevent, reduce, control the pollution of the shared aquifer. So, because this was targeted on the transboundary aquifer or groundwater, so the target area was that and the law of transboundary aquifer this particular is a concrete step forward towards the peaceful sharing of groundwater resources and uh, as until this time there was no instrument of international law that could provide a complete set of recommendation and guidelines. So, this was the first of its kinds and uh, that way has uh, very high degree of importance in terms of managing transboundary groundwater aquifers. Uh, US also U, uh, UN also attempted United Nations also attempted uh, uh, law on the non navigational use of international water course. So, for all other use uh, like of the transboundary rivers except the navigational uses. So, uh, they provided a framework of principle and rule that may be applied and adjusted to suit the characteristic of a particular international uh, water course or transboundary river. So, uh, the key guiding principle set out in this document targeted at the equitable and reasonable utilization of the resources, then application of appropriate measures to prevent harm to other states okay, on uh, this thing and the prior notification of planned measure. So, these were the three major uh, idea there were principles set out on to these that how you ensure equitable and uh, reasonable utilization, how you should ensure that no harm is being provided to the lower riparian state or upper riparian state for that matter and uh, it said that in if any nation is going to plan any development activity or any sort of activity on the transboundary or international water courses, it must notify the uh, involved nations or other parties as well. However, this could not be ratified because it need a minimum of 35 nations to sign it, but uh, since that was not achieved, so this uh, convention is still not ratified. Then there were a few other uh, small initiatives taken by the United Nations in uh, 2013 inter, uh, was uh, declared as an international year on of water cooperation. So, in 2011 February the United Nations General Assembly uh, declared that 2013 will be celebrated as an international year of water cooperation. Then uh, the World Water Day of 2009 uh, was uh, dedicated to the theme of shared water and shared opportunities with a focus on transboundary water. So, this falls on to the 22nd March World Water Day. Okay. Then uh, the UN water thematic priority area on transboundary waters was uh, considered. So, they considered transboundary water as a thematic priority area under UN water initiative and intended to provide a platform for promoting the coherence and coordinating activities, coordination activities in the member states okay, over the transboundary rivers. So, these are some of the uh, United Nations initiative in this uh, respect. If you see, um, we will, uh, we can conclude this over here. So, this was uh, obviously there is lot of literature available onto the transboundary uh, issues because uh, the transboundary management of water has been a big issue and there is a quite a few literature available. Uh, if someone is interested they can go to uh, through all these some suggested reading. There are many other available uh, on the different sources, different platforms. So, these are some of the uh, books or these are some of the uh, documents which consider. So, you have history and future of the shared water resources uh, which is by the United Nations. Then there is a atlas of transboundary aquifers, there is an international water review of legal and institutional framework, okay. there is a fresh water and international laws. So, uh, there are all these uh, documents and books are available onto the United Nations website. Okay. Some of uh, many of uh, books are there onto the other platform also. These are some of the case studies, uh, those who are interested can go through this, there are international management 
on the Columbia River system, Mekong case study, then Nile case study, Rhine case study which is more on to the water quality aspect. So, there are a uh, variety of other documents available and uh, those who are interested can explore further. So, uh, with this we conclude the discussion on the, uh, we conclude this discussion on international waters or uh, global water diplomacy. And eventually uh, we conclude in, in a way we conclude the entire discussion on this course. Uh, we will use the next two sessions for a comprehensive summary of whatsoever has been discussed so far from week 1. So, thank you, thank you for participating in this course, thank you for uh, being with us throughout the uh, 12 weeks and uh, we will uh, come back with a summary and that will be the end of this course, thank you.